This is A Long Walk to Water, Chapter 8. So we're following along on page 45. Southern Sudan, 2008. It was like music, the sound of Akir's laugh. Naya's father had decided that Akir needed a doctor, so Naya and her mother had taken Akir to the special place, a big white tent full of people who were sick or hurt, with doctors and nurses to help them. After just two doses of medicine, Akir was nearly her old self again, still thin and weak, but able to laugh as Naya sat on the floor next to her cot and played a clapping game with her. The nurse, a white woman, was talking to Naya's mother. Her sickness came from the water, the nurse explained. She should drink only good, clean water. If the water is dirty, you should boil it for a count of 200 before she drinks it. Naya's mother nodded that she understood but Naya could see the worry in her eyes. The water from the holes in the lake bed could be collected only in tiny amounts. If her mother tried to boil such a small amount, the pot would be dry long before they could count to 200. It was a good thing then that they would soon be returning to the village. The water that Naya fetched from the pond in the plastic jug could be boiled before they drank it. But what about next year at camp and the year after that? And even at home, whenever Naya made the long, hot walk to the pond, she had to drink as soon as she got there. She would never be able to stop Akir from doing the same. Southern Sudan, 1985. The lake's surface was calm, and once the boats had pulled away from the shore, there was not much to see, just water and more water. They paddled for hours. The scenery and motion were so monotonous that Selva might have slept except he was afraid that if he did, he might fall over the side. He kept himself awake by counting the strokes of Uncle's paddle and trying to gauge how far the canoe traveled with every 20 strokes. Finally, the boats pulled up to an island in the middle of the river. This was where the fishermen of the Nile lived and worked. Salva was amazed by what he saw in the fishing community. It was the first place in their weeks of walking that had an abundance of food. The villagers ate a lot of fish, of course, and hippo, and crocodile meat as well. But even more impressive were the number of crops they grew. Cassava, sugarcane, yams. It was easy to grow food when there was a whole river to water the crops. None of the travelers had money or anything of value to trade, so they had to beg for food. The exception was uncle. The fishermen gave him food without having to be asked. Salva could not tell if this was because uncle seemed to be the leader of the group or because they were afraid of his gun. Uncle shared his food with Salva, a piece of sugar cane to suck on right away, then fish that they cooked over a fire, and yams roasted in the ashes. The sugar cane juice soothed the sharpest edge of Salva's hunger. He was able to eat the rest of the meal slowly, making each bite last a long time. At home, Salva had never been hungry. His family, his family owned many cattle. They were among the better off families in their village of Louis Norik. They ate mostly porridge made from sorghum and milk. Every so often, his father went to the marketplace by bicycle and brought home bags of beans and rice. These had been grown elsewhere because few crops could be raised in the dry, semi-desert region of Louis Norik. As a special treat, his father sometimes brought mangoes. A bag of mangoes was awkward to carry, especially when the bicycle was already loaded with other goods. So he wedged the mangoes into the spokes of his bicycle wheels. When Salva ran to greet him, he could see the green-skinned mangoes spinning gaily in, the, in a blur as his father pedaled. Salva would take a mango from the spokes almost before his father had dismounted. His mother would peel it for him, its juicy insides the same color as her headscarf. She would slice the flesh away from the big flat seed. Salva loved the sweet slices, but his favorite part was the seed. There was always plenty of fruit that clung stubbornly to the seed. He would nibble and suck at it to get every last shred, making it last for hours. There were no mangoes among the fishermen's great stores, but sucking on his piece of sugar cane reminded Salva of those happier times. He wondered if he would ever again see his father riding a bicycle with mangoes in its spokes. As the sun touched the horizon, the fishermen abruptly went into their tents. They weren't really tents, just white mosquito netting hung or draped to make a space so they could lie down inside. Not one fisherman stayed to talk or eat more or do anything else. It was almost as if they all vanished at the same moment. 
Only a few minutes later, mosquitoes rose up from the water, from the reeds, from everywhere. Huge dark clouds of them appeared, their high-pitched whine filling the air. Thousands, maybe millions of hungry mosquitoes massed so thickly that in one breath Salva could have ended up with a mouthful if he wasn't careful. And even if he was, they were everywhere, in his eyes, nose, ears, on every part of his body. The fishermen stayed in their nets the whole night long. They had even dug channels from inside the nets to just beyond them so that they could urinate without having to leave their little tents. It didn't matter how often Salva swatted at the mosquitoes, or that one swat killed dozens at a time. For every one he killed, it seemed that hundreds more swarmed to, in to take its place. With their high singing whine constantly in his ears, Salva slapped and waved at them in fr frustration all night long. No one in the group got any sleep. The mosquitoes made sure of that. In the morning, Salva was covered with bites. The worst ones were the, in the exact middle of his back, where he couldn't reach to scratch. Those he could reach, though, he scratched until they bled. The travelers got into their boats one more time to paddle from the island to the other side of the Nile. The fishermen had warned the group to take plenty of water for, for the next stretch of their journey. Salva still had the gourd that the old woman had given him. Others in the group had gourds, too, or plastic bottles. But there were some who did not have a container. They tore strips from their clothing and soaked them in a desperate attempt to carry at least a little water with them. Ahead lay the most difficult part of their journey, the Okobo Desert.